Rainstorms are often welcome events for Minnesota farmers and gardeners. However, stormwater runoff from paved streets and parking lots can be a problem for urban residents and the environment. Minnesota cities and counties are responsible under federal, state, and local laws for managing stormwater. To minimize flooding, control erosion, and keep nutrients like phosphorus and other pollutants from entering our lakes and streams. To help select an appropriate stormwater best management practice for roadway or parking lot projects, Minnesota's local Road Research Board produced a guide for local public works managers called Decision Tree for Stormwater Best Management Practices, BMPs. The decision tree suggests four basic steps for selecting a stormwater treatment for an upcoming project. Describe the kind of project it is. Determine what regulations apply. Assemble a toolbox of best possible management practices. And then select the best tool for the project. Minnesota city and county engineers have at least seven stormwater best management practices to choose from, described in detail in the LRRB decision tree. Stormwater ponds, bioretention or rain gardens, underground detention, underground treatment, infiltration, permeable pavements, and tree or planter boxes. To bring the decision tree to life, we're going to hear from local public works managers in Minnesota who are already putting these stormwater BMPs to work. Woodbury engineer Paul Coppy explains best management practice number one, stormwater ponds. This is one of many ponds that service a 600 acre uh, residential development. The ponds were designed into the overall development plan. The stormwater is temporarily detained in the pond to allow time for the sediment to settle to the bottom. And the remaining clean water is then discharged out at a um, reasonable rate downstream. A typical stormwater pond is designed for a 25 year life cycle. At the end of that life cycle, major maintenance typically needed where you bring in heavy equipment and actually dredge out the sediments off the bottom of the pond, restoring its original volume. Stormwater ponds have been around for many years and have been studied and the removal efficiencies for sediment is approximately 90%. Other nutrients are about 70%, so they're an effective method for a known effective method to treat stormwater. For best management practice number two, bioretention or rain gardens, we hear from Corey Slagle at the Washington County Public Works Department. Bioretention cell rain garden, uh, it's an alternative we have to uh, treat stormwater uh, and the, the quality of the, the runoff on our uh, site. Uh, they help by removing uh, pollutants from your stormwater. In addition to the uh, environmental benefits and rate and volume control, they also add, uh, have the potential to add some uh, aesthetic and landscaping benefit to your site. We have uh, what's called curb cuts uh, in the parking lot. Uh, so that's uh, a depression in the curb. The water is allowed to uh, flow through there into the rain garden. We'll have mulch on the top. Um, and then uh, we'll have a, a soil media below that, which is a sand and compost mix that allow the water to infiltrate. Uh, into the ground. They're pretty low maintenance. Uh, once they're uh, constructed and fully operating, uh, we usually have to, only have to do maintenance on them once or twice a year. As you can see, they're uh, in really good shape. They function well. They've never overflowed. So they've been working for us for six years now. A green roof, another form of bioretention, is used by the Ramsey Washington Metro Watershed District. District Administrator Cliff Eichinger explains. A green roof is an advantage for stormwater management because it can also absorb and hold water. Uh, it will transpire more water because of the plant activity. In general, we think we're capturing and holding on the roof about 80% of the annual rainfall. We think it's a, it's a worthwhile BMP for stormwater management, but it is a, an expensive option. best management practice number three is underground detention. Maplewood engineer Michael Thompson explains. Underground detention, what we have here is the city of Maplewood, a neighborhood street reconstruction project, and how we're getting detention is through a 60 inch underground pipe. So that really detains the water and lets it flow out over time, and that relieves the stress on the downstream stormwater system. So the pipe is 
under the street for, like I said, about two, two and a half blocks, and it, it's just a very large volume. So that helps in preventing downstream erosion and uh, really containing some of that water during these rainfalls. With underground detention, you don't get a whole lot of contaminant reduction. It's more of attenuating those peak flows. But with underground detention, unlike um, stormwater treatment systems where you're removing the pollutants, we really don't have to do a lot of maintenance on underground detention. And the reason the city went with underground detention was you know, we, it, this is such a tight urban environment that we don't have the room above ground, so we really had to go underground. Another example of underground detention, used this time in conjunction with rain gardens, is described by Lisa Cerny, Director of Surface Waters and Sewers for the City of Minneapolis. This project is known as our 37th Avenue North Greenway project. It was originally in our capital program as a flood control project. And uh, once we got into design, working with the neighborhoods, we also found the opportunity to include stormwater. The project is uh, basically uh, four and a half blocks of rain gardens that drain down through the, the filtration soil to a drain tile that's surrounded by iron enhanced sand and then down into large box culverts. From that point, it goes through pipes, and it eventually gets to Crystal Lake. There was an existing street here. It was 37th Avenue North. We replaced the street with the box culverts, with the rain garden, and with the path. This is fairly new infrastructure for us, but the maintenance is regular mowing in the spring, summer, and fall, as well as ensuring that the plant material is stabilized and there isn't erosion that's occurring during large rain events. The underground culverts um, we have access manholes that we will be entering in through on a regular basis to both inspect as well as clean out any sediment that builds up. The beauty of this project is that there, there not only do we get water quality, but there's also a neighborhood benefit. There's a, a, a lovely path on top of the infrastructure allowing pedestrians, bikers to move from east to west. Best management practice number four is underground treatment through use of devices such as hydrodynamic separators, sump catch basins, and wet vaults. The city of Minnetonka recently installed a hydrodynamic separator during the reconstruction of Dominic Drive Road to protect nearby Shady Oak Lake from stormwater pollution. Hydrodynamic separators are structural BMPs that create a swirling vortex to separate floatable debris and sediment from the stormwater. Vacuum trucks are typically used for removal of accumulated pollutants. Best management practice number five is infiltration, sometimes called swales, described by Professor John Gulliver and graduate student of the University of Minnesota Department of Civil Engineering. A swell is an underappreciated uh, infiltration practice. A swell is basically a, a roadside drainage ditch and this swell here can infiltrate almost entirely the water that runs off this road. Swales can also treat the water. They treat the water because the water infiltrates through the surface. Uh, it pulls out the sediments that are in the water and it pulls out the uh, hydrocarbons that are in the oils through the organic material that's in the soils and it pulls out the metals. So we are doing research on the infiltration rates of swales. We want to identify how much water infiltrates into a swale. Farzana, my student, has a technique that she's using to measure the infiltration rates. How we do the test is uh, we pound this whole infiltrometer into the soil. We pound it up to five centimeter up to this depth and then we fill this infiltrometer with water up to a certain height and uh, let the water infiltrate into the soil. Uh, we found that there is a uh, wide spatial variation of uh, the hydraulic conductivity of the soil in the same swell. Best management practice number six is the use of permeable pavements. First, we hear from Mark Maloney, Shoreview Director of Public Works. The neighborhood that we use is comprised of about a mile of public streets. And uh, 
about 9,000 square yards of pervious concrete paving went down in this project, which at the time it was done in 2009 was the largest project globally. The road surface in this neighborhood is seven inches of pervious concrete. Underneath that is an 18 inch layer of coarse filter aggregate. And when water passes through the pavement, it goes down into the filter aggregate and then infiltrates naturally into the sandy soils that were native to this area. The city maintains this neighborhood and the pavements in it by uh, re using a regenerative air sweeper that we use in other parts of the city as well. It passes through this neighborhood about once every other month. The benefit of using a, por a porous or a pervious pavement surface in this project was that we can manage the quantity and the quality of the stormwater that's going back into the aquifer. There's recent research shows that a significant amount of contaminants can be removed from surface water that passes through a pervious or a porous pavement. Next, we hear about another example of best management practice number six, using permeable asphalt pavement from Cliff Eichinger at the Ramsey Washington Metro Watershed District. This parking lot is porous asphalt. It was the actual first installation of porous asphalt in Minnesota in uh, late 2005. Even though we've got some clogging primarily in the drive lane, the parking bays are still pretty permeable. So um, when you consider that porous asphalt, when it's first laid down, can infiltrate 100 inches an hour, and we never get more than five inches an hour. Um, so even though it's part of it's clogged, the remaining non-clogged areas can still take all the runoff. Even though it's a little bit more expensive, when you figure land costs, additional piping for conveyance, uh, it actually is a wash, sometimes even cheaper. Best management practice number seven is the use of tree boxes and trenches. We again hear from Cliff Eichinger as he explains how tree trenches were used as one part of a comprehensive stormwater retrofit project at the Maplewood Mall. We are uh, retrofitting a 1975 mall and 35 acre parking lot uh, with stormwater BMPs to reduce the volume of stormwater coming off. We primarily went the route of using tree trenches because they don't eliminate a lot of parking. So the trees are watered from the bottom up. Water gets to the bottom of the trench, fills the rock, depending on the rainstorm event, fills it up various heights. The tree boxes are put in, and then the trees are dropped into the boxes and they're filled up with more rock. Um, fairly innovative, fairly simple system that uh, is designed to capture at least an inch of water over the entire 35 acres of parking lot. The intent of this whole project was to reduce the volume of water and the nutrient load to Coleman Lake, which is just a mile downstream. And that's an impaired water, excess nutrients, according to the standards of the state of Minnesota. And it's impaired, so we had to develop an implementation plan. And this is one of our projects that we've identified to try to uh, reduce those lo the loading to the lake. For detailed guidance on selecting appropriate stormwater best management practices for roadway or parking lot projects, consult the Minnesota Local Road Research Board Guide, Decision Tree for Stormwater Best Management Practices, BMPs, available at the Minnesota DOT Library or on the LRRB website.